But right now, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Ron Williams, who is the Sloan Fellow Class of 1984 and on the MIT Corporation. Ron is the former chair and CEO of Aetna Inc., a leading diversified benefits company. And during his tenure, Aetna was named Fortune's most admired company in healthcare for three consecutive years. Under his leadership, Aetna sought to make a positive impact on healthcare in America by serving as a catalyst for changes, focusing the industry, public policy leaders, physicians, and employers on issues aimed at increasing access and affordability and transforming American healthcare into a more efficient system that delivers greater value to all Americans. Following his retirement from Aetna in 2011, Ron founded RW2 Enterprises, a business advisory firm which serves as a platform for his private equity, corporate board, consulting, speaking, and philanthropic activities. We are so fortunate to have Ron here with us this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Ron Williams to the podium. Well, thank you. I see you got the introduction my father sent over. Uh, <laughs> uh, this has really been a remarkable afternoon for me. Uh, it's one, it's an opportunity to benefit from the superb work that the faculty at Sloan has been doing. And um, I think there's a huge opportunity here to, to, to not only continue the excellent work that's being done, but to have enormous impact on a system that is desperately in need of transformation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, an overview and go through pretty quickly kind of the nature of the problem, which is really spending, it's cost, it's quality, it's really value in the system. And then really focus on the changing roles that we see in terms of the role of consumers, managed care organizations and, and providers, and then conclude uh, with the summary. I think the take home message here is that health reform has really legitimized the transformation of the healthcare system. I can tell you that before healthcare reform uh, became an important topic in America, when I went to social events and said I was involved in health insurance, people immediately passed out the pillows and no one wanted to talk to me about anything I did. As health reform unfolded, everyone wanted to talk about healthcare. <laughs> And so one of the real benefits has been the legitimization of the transformation of the system. As a result of that, the system is really going to begin to be held much more accountable for cost as well as the performance of uh, healthcare um, the going forward. Now, th this slide gives you a sense of all of the different aspects of the healthcare industry that uh, participate as far as external forces in shaping both the cost, quality, and the value. Health reform ref impacted all of the areas in the red. And so this is one of the few times when you see an entire industry undergoing a transformation, and whether it is the pharmaceutical manufacturing, medical devices, the healthcare marketplace, you name it, there is a lot of external work going on. Now, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, ACA, really has been mostly about access and expanding coverage to healthcare. And it has really done very little to date in terms of cost and healthcare delivery. The biggest forces at work in this area really have been the private employer-sponsored insurance system in the country, principally driven by the Fortune 100 employers who themselves self-insure and are responsible for the cost of their employees. Now, in terms of the ACA, um, one of the things that we see, and we've got some kind of new um, data coming in, but the takeaway is that about 23 million people have insurance today, speaking about, say, roughly February 2015. Some of those were young adults who were, were covered up to 26. 
Some were about, I'd say about 11 million or so, close to 12 million are consumers who purchased in the new marketplaces. Some of those people had insurance before and ended up just purchasing it in the particular um, exchange. And then there were others who purchased it directly from insurers. We still have an enormous number of people who do not have insurance in the country. And so we do have more work to do in access, but access was really what it was about. This is a slide most of you have seen. Takeaway here is we spend an enormous amount. This shows what we spent between uh, 08 and 14. When you go forward, we're going to be approaching 20% of GDP. Now, I don't know where the break point is, but trees do not grow to the sky. There is a point at which this will begin to squeeze all of the other aspects of our both personal budgets as well as the federal budget and the state budget. And so at this level of spending, we are going to see increasing pressure to address this issue. Now, one of the things that we get asked uh, regularly is about the cost of our delivery system relative to other uh, developed countries. And this slide has a lot of data on it, but I think the big takeaway is we spend a lot more per patient and we spend a lot more in terms of the overall cost. And I wanna dig down a little bit on this and really focus on this slide. Because one of the questions is always why. Are we doing more services? Are we using higher technology, more frequency? And the reality is when you really begin to peel it all back, it really turns out to be driven principally by prices. Now prices doesn't take into account the utilization of those healthcare services. But it really turns out to be driven in the US principally by pricing factors. And one of the questions I think someone asked earlier was a question about we are a wealthier country and is that one of the reasons we spend so much more on healthcare? This is a great analysis that was done a few years, a couple of years ago. And it took into account what the estimated spending should be based on the wealth of the US relative to other countries. And what you can see in the total spending is that about 23% of the spending would be excess relative to the wealth effect in the US. And you can see how that breaks out by the different categories, outpatient care, inpatient. And one of the one areas, one area that we spend less than other countries is actually in long-term care and care in the home. So we're overspending in, in these other categories and underspending in that category. Now, one of the questions I often get is, well, why is it that we are spending so much? What's driving it? And I think one of the factors is when you look at what physician compensation is in the US, it is much greater than it is in other countries. Now, in fairness to physicians, we have the world's worst method of financing physician education, I think, of any country I know, because physicians have enormous debt when they graduate, and they need income to be able to pay off that debt. But the reality is, if you contrast Australia, which where a, a physician would earn about 92,000, to the US, where it would be 186,000, that's a pretty dramatic difference. Also, when you look at specialists, and one of our big differences is our delivery system has more specialists and less primary care. Other systems tend to have the opposite. They have more primary care and fewer specialists. And so you can see that an orthopedic surgeon in the US actually does pretty good relative to an orthopedic surgeon who happens to practice in Australia. Now, um, when you look at kind of what the government pays in terms of versus what the commercial or employer-based insurance or private payers pay, we have another problem because we have a bit of a cost shift. If you just take the US, public payers, which includes Medicaid and Medicare, would pay $60, and the private payers pay $133, and they are, in effect, subsidizing, they believe, the underpayment from the point of view of the uh, public payers. And you can see the same thing is, is in effect when we look at specialty care. This would be hip replacement. You can see that public payers would pay about 1,600 in the US versus almost 4,000 would be what a private payer would pay. 
And so that is one of the uh, important contributing factors. Now, this is a way to shift from the physicians to the hospitals and look at what hospital services cost in the selected countries. And again, you can see that by and large, our hospital um, services cost a lot more. Now, some of this has to do with, um, again, the lack of investment in the home health care structure in the U.S. A lot of it also has to do with consumer expectations and choice and preference in the U.S. And I often uh, ask um, how many people would send their child to a hospital that didn't give them a single occupancy room? And how many would be comfortable with their child being on a ward with eight other children? And I can tell you in the U.S., I rarely get a hand goes up that says I'll volunteer for the ward with eight other children. Now, that's not what's driving the cost per se, but it's indicative of our preferences and our consumer uh, wishes for how we wish to consume and deliver care. Now, this is a great study because it was done here in Massachusetts. And it looked at the uh, rate of increase in between 07, 08, 08, 09. And it looked at the pure price effect on the rate of increase in inpatient stays and outpatient care and decouple and, and deanalyze it in terms of whether it was the number of stays, the shift to more expensive providers, and the service mix. And the conclusion of this particular study was it was all about price. And I'll come back to that in a minute, because particularly in the relationships between hospitals and health plans, it's been a revenue game. Hospitals have historically solved all problems by increasing their what's called the charge master and negotiating higher and higher rates. And that, those days have pretty much come to an end, and we're going to see some dramatic changes as a result of it. Now, I'll shift to the changing roles here and talk a little bit about um, consumers. Consumers more and more, particularly the millennial generation, as they mature, they really want to be empowered. We see more and more people who do want to get engaged. They want the tools to navigate the system. And they really want to be able to arrange their health care in a way that they can engage with others and be much more informed. And so the consumer, when I grew up, you know, my mother went to the doctor. She sat in the waiting room. She'd wait two or three hours. She would go in. She'd see the doctor. She wouldn't ask him any questions at all. And she would leave and be totally confused about what she would do. Now, patients come in. The physicians say they see a lot of patients who are internet positive. I don't know how many of you have heard that term, but internet positive is the patient who shows up with a printout about three times his size and has diagnosed themselves, has all the recommendations that their friends, relatives, and the internet have given them, and the physician has to kind of talk them through that. So consumers are, in fact, changing. There's also an enormous amount of money that is spent on wellness and fitness and other um, kind of alternative medicine, some of which has clinical support and a lot of which has absolutely no clinical support. I mean, you could tell people it's natural and they want it, and natural could include arsenic and you know a bunch of other things that aren't good for you, but somehow consumers have it in their mind that natural is better, even though it may not be clinically supported. So this is going to be an increasingly important area, and it is a positive opportunity for engagement, particularly around fitness, exercise, and some of the things that we know have a positive effect. Now, I want to talk briefly about managed care, because health plans, insurance company, managed care organizations, their traditional business model is described here. It was about business-to-business -business marketing, selling to employers, it was about managing the insurance risk as an actuarial organization. It was about going out and negotiating discounts off of bill charges, which very few people in America actually pay. And it was about the transaction processing, paying the claims, answering the calls, servicing the organization. That was the model historically. The model today is a whole set of different skills and capabilities which include interacting with customers in an online, mobile, and social way, creating wellness programs around engagement, um, uh, giving people uh, the ability to get screened and, and, and to get preventive services. There's an enormous amount of operational excellence, um, of lean engineering in terms of transaction and process flow. 
And importantly, they have focused on disease management, care management, condition management, identifying that small percentage of patients who really drive cost and looking for opportunities to work with the, with the physicians and hospital systems to improve the performance there. Big data, when I ran Aetna, about 20% of our staff was in our IT department. And we had an enormous group of people focused on data, analytics, uh, utilizing both the administrative data that we had and also lab data and pharmacy data to identify these patients. I think the um, other thing that we focused a lot on was increasing our level of com consumer insight to figure out how to engage and activate patients. Over the past several years, managed care organizations fall into these categories, and what we've seen is that uh, you can, they tended to focus on particular segments, commercial, government, me Medicare, Medicaid, small group individual, and some of these exchanges. What we're seeing is national plans, super regional, regional, local markets, niche, and the big question will be, will providers enter the insurance market and begin to, to try to function like, as health plans, much like Kaiser Permanente does? It was interesting to hear the Kaiser story. I spent uh, almost 20 years in California with them as a competitor. Anybody who thinks emulating Kaiser is easy to do should have a conversation with Bernie Tyson. It is an incredibly hard thing to do. It is years in the making. And there probably are not more than 10 systems in the country that have the capability to actually perform in an integrated way in the near term at the level that a company like Kaiser does. Now, providers are under a series of very substantial changes. Medicare reimbursement is going down. There are more people who are shifting to the public programs. Uh, many of the uninsured who uh, are participating in the Medicaid program are being reimbursed to providers at Medicaid, at, at Medicaid rates. Medicaid rates are significantly lower in most states than Medicare rates. And so that cost shift between the commercial market paying more and the public payers paying less is placing e even greater reduction in the compensation providers are getting from the private payers. Un good news is uncompensated care is going down, but by and large, consumers are having much greater cost shifting and have higher deductibles and more financial responsibility. And then there's a whole new set of regulatory rules. The headline here is that Historically, hospital systems in particular, the answer to every problem at negotiation was raise revenue. And the ability to absorb those kinds of revenue increases simply will not exist, and they're going to have to re-engineer their system. And we heard a lot of discussion today about some really great initiatives to help them do that. And I think it's a unique place where Sloan can really uh, participate. The, the, I'm, I'm gonna just briefly touch on academic medical centers the headline is most parts of the country, big trouble, research dollars are going down, the clinical enterprise they're involved in isn't well suited to the new world, and the education funding isn't really where it needs to be, and the mechanism is just pretty clunky to fund medical education. They're looking at a variety of initiatives, um, outcomes, but focusing on productivity standards, which is in a way what we heard a lot about today, and cost reduction is going to be critical. And I think we heard from uh, Mass General some of the work they have underway to really address some of these things. I think the headline on providers, again, is that they have a strategic dilemma. Their business model today, which has been driven by fee-for-service and the ability to raise revenue, is not a model that is going to be sustainable in the long term. The skills and competencies they need for tomorrow managing in a capitated environment, take, and, and being responsible for delivering the care to a patient population effectively will require them to manage very different levers in their business model. And the trick is, if you implement those skills you need in the future today, today you will lose money. Unfortunately, if you wait until it's profitable to manifest those new skills, you will not have developed them. So they have a fundamental business transition challenge in terms of both timing, transition of the culture, and transition of the organizational and clinical effectiveness of the organization. 
they're, one of the things they'll have to figure out is how do they manage everything going on outside of the hospital. Historically, hospitals focused on what happened in their four walls. Physicians focused on what happened in, in the office principally with some guidance on what to do at home. In reality, to manage the health of the population, you have to manage what happens at work, you have to manage, broadly speaking, in the community, and you have to reach into the home with support and guidance and assistance for patients. So this is really going to be a very important set of undertakings. This just describes kind of the stair step of migration of different payment mechanisms. Um, at the end of it, it's capitation and performance-based contracting. And the um, skills required are you know, quite, quite different. It requires new capabilities. We've heard about some of these things, care teams, uh, capacity to, to managing the care for patients that increase hospital risk, telehealth, uh, collaboration with managed care, and the cultural transition that physicians are gonna have to go, go through. At the end of the day, um, I think the system that's going to work is going to be much more of a collaborative system between hospital systems, physicians, and, and health plans. There's an opportunity to eliminate the redundancy for, for health plans to do what they know how to do quite well, and for the care delivery system to know how to do what it does quite well, but to have a much more seamless integrated system that is designed to better manage the health of the population. And all of it has to take into account strengthening the cybersecurity of the data. Because right now, the breaches we've experienced um, is, is, have really been fairly nominal. This is just a little chart. These are the number of do-it-yourself hacking kits <laughs> that are available. You basically buy the kit and you become an instant hacker. You don't have to know much of anything. <laughs> other than to be able to buy the kit. This just describes the breaches that we see, and they're going to increase dramatically. And what we have not yet seen are what I describe as diagnosis-based breaches. At some point, people are gonna figure out that beyond financial data, there is clinical data, and they're gonna sweep these systems for clinical data that people would view as confidential and private and prefer not to have publicized and they're going to begin to view that as another monetary line of business. So um, let's hope it takes them a while to get there, but I predict that it will in fact happen. If you were, had a particular cancer, you might not prefer to have that widely publicized if you were a public figure, for example. And so we can expect to see that kind of problem. I'm gonna close uh, quickly here. I've covered most of this stuff. I think consumers, it's all about mobile, social, digital. It's gonna be a retail healthcare market. They're going to expect an Amazon-like experience from the health plans and from physicians and hospitals in the healthcare delivery system. Pricing over time is gonna to go to a reference pricing that the health plans will design benefits that are, that are structured to have a market clearing level of reimbursement to the member. And that market clearing level will not be the most expensive provider in town. And when the consumer goes retail, they're gonna to have to decide how much they wanna pay up to go to institution A versus institution B. We've talked about high deductible plans and uh, hopefully consumers will become more uh, compliant. Health plans, there was a lot of angst about the new regulatory framework with the ACA. I explained to people that when I ran Aetna, we were regulated by 50 states, four federal agencies, and the city of San Francisco. <laughs> so adding the federal government to managing the regulatory environment was kind of not exactly the worst thing that plans didn't know how to manage effectively. Over time, they're all gonna have commercial Medicaid plus, there will be continued consolidation, and the plans that are really uh, thoughtful will figure out how to collaborate with physicians and hospitals in a risk-sharing way. And we want to share risk and opportunity for profit sharing. You don't want to turn the healthcare delivery system into an insurance company. Because in a period of stable or moderate medical cost trend, it all looks easy. Try running a health plan when you price it at 6% and your medical trend comes in at 9 It gets very ugly very fast. And then hospitals will be deciding what do they cut and where do they cut it in order to make certain that those patients are looked after. 
Um, I think the um, final point I would make is that this issue of the transition to the business model is a very, very significant issue for many institutions. Um, you know, I, I'm struck by some of the work going on here that where the reimbursement to the hospital systems has basically been capped and they've been asked. The thing that nobody points out is Massachusetts has the absolute highest cost system of any place in the country. <laughs> so reducing the cost here, while it is important progress, has very little to do with what people are gonna have to do in Iowa and in Chicago and in these other markets because they don't get either the federal dollars or they don't have the historic level of built-in high uh, level of uh, cost base. Um, I think at this point, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, uh, close. I'm gonna close with, you know, this is the quote or paraphrase of Darwin's quote, which it really is all about change. And it has been very refreshing for me to hear about a lot of the work here because at the root of all of this is large scale institutional transformation of highly skilled professionals who have a deep sense of the way they were trained and a point of view about how to conduct their business. And redirecting that and getting them to do things differently is no small challenge, but that is the work that needs to be done if we are to slow down the rate of increase in healthcare costs and improve the value that consumers are receiving. So with that, I would open it up to uh, questions. Uh, yes, we'll get a mic so everyone can hear you. On the chart that uh, was, was comparing the per capita cost for various countries versus the United States, the second chart was a detail of where it was being spent, and you made the point that we don't spend enough in long-term care. On that chart, the hospital piece was actually not unusual. It wasn't where the wealth effect had a big, there wasn't a big red section there. It was really on the outpatient side. I'm not sure how you reconcile that with the other chart that talked about price on hospitals being an important factor. Yeah, well, I, I think you have to understand that for a lot of the outpatient activity, it's really facility-based charges in the hospital. It, it's viewed as a hospital expense because if the outpatient center is within 35 miles or so, it, then it, it, it's viewed as a hospital. So I think, yeah, I, I think that would, would accommodate that. Uh, yes? Patients are required, or consumers are required to pay more and more of the cost of health care. One of the problems I think people run into is you can't find out how much things cost in well, different hospitals and different providers in different places? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's a great question. And I think transparency of information is being addressed. For example, before I left, Ed, but left Aetna, we put on our website, a member could go in, they could actually look at the physician they wanted to see, and we would tell you what your out-of-pocket expense would be based on your specific health, uh, employer plan and our specific fee schedule with that uh, physician. Now, when you deal with hospital services, we could give ranges because it's so, it's so much more complex. But I think the, the, the answer is we do need price transparency, but more importantly, we need quality transparency because if you're dealing with what I call preference-sensitive care, you can get it or not get it. It's not that big a deal. You've had it before. If you were in Europe, you'd write, you just go down and buy the medication, but here you gotta go see somebody to get the prescription. Their cost is relevant. If you have something serious, you want the best quality of care based on the clinical studies. Uh, let's see, we'll work our way to the back. There's a woman there, and then we'll do the gentleman in the back. Thank you for your very informative presentation. I'm Karen Roof from St. Paul, and um, I was very impressed with an acquisition that Aetna made of iTriage in Denver. And I'd like you to maybe speak a bit to um, your vision for how consumers can be more empowered in making their own healthcare decisions with tools like that and combined with their own responsibility for um, having some skin in the game for paying. Yeah, I, I think those of you who don't know, iTriage is a uh, mobile app that a member can go in. There's great data on symptoms. There's availability of physicians in your area that are uh, in network, et cetera. I think the whole notion is Amazon-like experience, that 
consumers, as they pay more, are going to begin to demand the kinds of information, accessibility, and tools. And that that is going to be a fundamentally important part of getting consumers in, engaged and hopefully more compliant. The gentleman in the back. So the slide you showed on uh, the disproportionately high pay of specialists in the United States is familiar. Do you see the specialty boards as being allies in reform, or are they standing in the way? I'm curious for your thoughts on that. Well, this is an uh, interesting topic. One I have never fully understood. I, I, I will start with saying, I don't know how many of you have a pediatrician in your family, but if you do, there should be a special place in heaven for anybody who becomes a pediatrician, because they are the least paid physicians <laughs> in the whole system. Physician compensation is, in essence, set by other physicians. The relative value units, which value procedural activity over cognitive skill of diagnosing an infant or diagnosing primary care, is a set of rules set by the physician community. And then Medicare basically sanctions it, and then the health plans leverage off of it. So, I am all for increasing compensation to pediatricians, increasing compensation to primary care physicians. Therefore, that means you have to reduce it to specialists because we're not gonna spend more. Hi, uh, do you have any predictions about what will happen with the ACA and how you think, for instance, the, the essential health benefits might change over time so I could buy a personalized plan? It's very, very complicated, obviously, to buy yeah. health insurance. You know, I think, I think what will happen, like most of these legislative initiatives, is um, reality will set in. People will figure out that because it sounds like a good idea, it may or may not be. Experience will result in a round of changes. I think in the context of essential benefits, I think that's going to be a, a, a difficult one uh, because there are always constituencies who want to see more and more their particular point of view reflected in the benefit. Um, I think what we're likely to, to see is perhaps looking at the focus of narrowing the focus to things like the, the Preventive Services Task Force A and B, and uh, focusing on the real good consumer protections like no lifetime maximums, give people more flexibility to select benefits within that with maybe some stop loss corridors. So you, you, you may sign up for more out of pocket in that category, but you wouldn't be subject to uh, financial ruin if something were to happen that you didn't anticipate. Yes. Hello, thank you. Can you speak briefly to the challenges and opportunities of, in the convergence of healthcare and pharma? Well, I, th I think that uh, if you think about pharma, uh, the pharmaceutical industry has undergone very dramatic changes. And um, the way drugs are developed and discovered now is very different in the context of how much is done in-house versus how much is done in partnership with, with other companies. I think what we're going to have to, to look at is it's, it's the equivalent of paying for activity. Paying for medication that has a theoretical benefit but doesn't produce a benefit, <laughs> over time I suspect pharmaceutical companies and health plans will find ways to pay for clinical effectiveness, pay for control of hypertension, pay for control of diabetes, and I think that's going to be an important factor. I think the other factor is that the Me Too drug, the kind of era of the Me Too, you know, this one lasts eight hours, I'm going to premium charge for 12 hours, that, that's kind of come to an end. And so I think it will cause companies to look for those things that have really important therapeutic benefits. Uh, the hepatitis C uh, cure is an example of a really good medication I think it was very poorly communicated in terms of the value that it brought to the patient who was cured of what was a pretty severe uh, condition that led to much more expensive treatment. But I think they didn't do a good job of communicating that. Hi, my name is Ku'ui Curry. I'm a Sloan Fellow as well, class of 2013. Thank you so much for your presentation. 
Um, given your position within the current administration and your work on the Affordable Care Act and working in that area, what are your thoughts on the way that healthcare has been used as a political bargaining chip? Well, I would simply say that uh, the one thing I learned through my experience in the whole healthcare debate is that politics trumps policy, period. <laughs> And so I would not be expecting anything less in the future, <laughs> I would say regretfully. Um, I think people are well-intentioned um, that, I, I think everyone would agree, A, we should have everybody covered, <laughs> period. You know, and no American should not have, have health care. But I think in terms of how it's manifested, how much you need to protect people from themselves and their own bad judgment and preferences, there are different schools of thought about it, and it plays out in the political arena. Some people support, for example, medical savings accounts. Other people think it's a bad idea that people shouldn't be expected to save money to uh, pay for expenses. So we can expect that a lot of these things will play out very much in a political context. Yes, on the, on the question of uh, the price disparity, uh, U.S. And, and internationally, uh, looking at uh, medical devices and drugs, uh, roughly a doubling of, of price uh, in the U.S. versus overseas, a lot of different factors there. What's your view as to the biggest reasons? My, my understanding is, has been it's mostly because of uh, the ability to negotiate price overseas, where governments negotiate price on behalf of the whole country, whereas in the U.S. it's just not done that way. Do you see that as the, the biggest cause, and do you think that will ever change? You know, I think that um, it, it's, a, it, it's a very difficult issue. I think, I think one of the things that's underappreciated is the, for many categories of pharmaceutical development, the U.S. is financing the R&D for the globe. And so if we're making those kinds of investments here, it has to be paid for somewhere. You know, I've, uh, many of you read my background. I serve on the board of Johnson & Johnson. And uh, I have, so I've become much more knowledgeable about it. A pharmaceutical company, whether it's J&J &J or Pfizer or Merck or any of them, you can spend $3 billion on a drug and it's a dry hole. And that $3 billion just disappears. So there's an enormous amount of R&D that goes into it. If I worry that if we begin to price negotiate, it becomes a political process. And if you're an elected official, there is nothing better to give people than a free lunch. <laughs> Unfortunately, I personally have not found one. <laughs> so I, I worry that we need to make, certainly find ways to make all drugs accessible to people, but that we should use the market to uh, determine and make certain that people are getting an adequate return on what are substantial high-risk investments. There's a question all the way in the back there, and then, there's, then we'll shift to this side of the room in just a moment. Um, Ron, I'd like to have your opinion on some of the emerging startups in the um, healthcare, and particularly insurance space, like Oscar. Uh, what do you think of that? And the other follow-up question would be, if you had to start a company in this space, what would it look like? What would it do? What kind of... Uh, issue would it try to solve? Thank you. I think I would say that um, fundamentally, the startups and the companies that will do best are companies that are focused on improving quality and reducing costs, and that have a real viable value proposition associated with that. I cannot tell you how many people I've met. I would meet about 100 people a month who each would save me 2% of my expense, medical expense. <laughs> and, and so you, you really have to have a value proposition that impacts quality, impacts value, and helps the uh, overall system. You know, some of the applications I saw here, for example, the, the operations research that improved the effectiveness of the hospital, it lets the hospital absorb more volume, it probably increases employee satisfaction, and I mean, you have to have something that really is having a meaningful impact on the system, that the system is not likely to be interested in the peripheral areas around that. Consumer engagement is always gonna be important because consumers are gonna move digital, social, mobile, 
There are great examples. This iTriage app is just one example that, uh, uh, of a company that did that. I want to get the question here. I think we're coming pretty much to think this is our last question. Hi there. Here in New York State, we're on the cusp of seeing the no surprise billing law take effect, uh, which is us putting a toe in the water for pricing transparency. I'm wondering if you could comment on the role you think legislation in requiring more degrees of pricing transparency could play in bringing down uh, the prices. I know you said we're all sort of moving to a world where reference pricing will one day be the norm, but I mean, given the tension between providers and insurers uh, and that constant battle between them, what role is there for legislation to get us there faster? Yeah, you, you know, I think uh, there, there probably is an opportunity, for example, to have a published list price for certain services. But I think when you get into very complex services, it's a much more difficult thing for people to grasp because you don't know all the different items. But I think, I think there could be a, a role. My advice is to develop such a program in a collaborative way, to sit down with physicians, with hospital executives, with health plans, and try to come up with something, and, and consumer groups, and try to come up with something that gives the consumers the kind of price transparency they would expect in any economic relationship today. And I, it's something I think could be uh, helpful. Uh, I want to thank you. You've been a great audience. <laughs>